So the arm bone connects into this bone, and this bone connects to that. And this whole thing moves. In fact, the shoulder structure moves like this. The bones move this way. The collarbone and the shoulder blade lifts up. And that's why when you raise your arm, your arm gets very close to your ear. It doesn't stay down here. If I keep it down here, I can't bring it up anymore. The whole thing has to lift and you can even take it back. So that's the bone, and then the muscle would be the pectoralis, the chest muscle, comes over and attaches onto the arm, and it's the hugging muscle, the one that does this. And notice what happens, I've got my palms facing in, and when I bring them together, they naturally go down. And so that tells us where the shoulder muscle, or where the chest muscle connects, connects on the outside, and drags it over. If it's connected on the inside, wouldn't be a very satisfying time. In fact, in fact, that's what you do here. That's why you can go this way. Because the opposing muscle is always a, a muscle in opposition to one. One draws the bone up, the other one just puts the, arm, the bone away. So this draws it forward, then we have to have a yawning muscle that pulls it back. That's the latissimus dorsi the biggest muscle in terms of surface area in the body and it attaches to the arm across to the spine and there's another one close over here all the way down to the tail and if you watch boxers they have that muscle really well developed and they're bent over like this and so they're using the muscle back here underneath to get well developed spinal muscles and that shows up the muscle on top and when you punch you're supposed to bring the punch back and quicker quicker than you throw it so you're not out of guard, so you protect it, so you punch and pull back. Anything that draws the arm back, you're using that muscle. If you pull the kitty out of the tree, you're using that muscle back or down and back. So you on boxes, usually this is very well developed. But it attaches on the inside of the arm. The chest attaches on the outside. So on the back side, you can't spray it very far, but on the front side, you can spray the elbows across the shoulder. So those are the muscles. Then there's some smaller muscles up here. The deltoid, the actual shoulder muscle, is not a very strong muscle because it's got to lift the weight out there from back here. That's lousy leverage. That's like you're trying to pick up the arch board from here. I can't do it. It's uh, no leverage. So the shoulder muscle is really just a stabilizing muscle. It puts the arm in position so the more powerful muscles can do the work. So if I get my arm here, then I can use this big, powerful muscle to push it or to drag it. Yeah. So it's not a very powerful muscle. And then we have the shrugging muscles up here. So those are the muscles and bones that create the shoulder carrying. And what it does is it covers the whole top of the rib cage. And so it's hard to see how this fits to this. Well, if you see the skeleton, it's one of the more useful things about looking at the skeleton. You can see the bone structure carried directly from head to the rib cage to pelvis, and that's the way we want to draw it. These connections first, this going on the top. So we're going to build this back on top, just like the bone structure suggested. Um, and you can even see the rib cage gets very small at the top, and it gets bigger at the bottom, very much like a coat bottle. So we have that coat bottle structure underneath this shoulder carriage, and I think of that as a football player's shoulder pad. You can put them on top, they're very, very much the same shape. You take the deltoid and the chest and cut it off, not with a latissimus, but with a shoulder blade in the back, you get basically the design of a football player's shoulder pad, and that's how they were designed. So that's what we're going to try and get. So what we want to do is learn how to fit the head down to the rib cage. We're going to start with hit, fitting the head into the shoulder carriage so we understand how that works and then we'll go to the rib cage and, and uh, break it apart. So let's draw another head. Any kind of view where I get a lot of skull and a lot of face, I do that bulky triangle. The distance back is about equal to the distance down. <clears throat> and I can get very specific on it. We'll just leave it as is for now just leave it like that. Now when I connect the head, to the torso. If I can see it, I'm going to draw the throat. The throat is the center line of the neck, and it connects the chin to 
which is the end of the head and then the center line of the face to the pit of the neck, <coughs> which is the nexus of the shoulder girdle, the shoulder carriage, the head and neck, and the torso. And all these are the most important landmarks on the body. So we can see that we want to mark it. When you draw that stroke, don't worry about an Adam's apple. <coughs> Just draw through it. So you can go right from the chin down. You might see the bottom of the face, which is this digastric plane, down like that. I usually just do this, make it a nice curved gesture, and then refine it with an Adam's apple or with a little chiseled corner there or whatever to make some more grace to draw. So we want to move back to that pit of neck. And then the torso is going to build off that somehow. But this will be our beginning. Now the neck is just a two. And depending on its angle, when we view it, it's either just a true two or an hourglass. <clears throat> and when you draw the throat, the throat is going to be the front of the tube only on a perfect profile. So as soon as you do this, you're going to have to draw the two independently of this gesture line. So what we'll do is we'll draw the two and the two might be stiff or it might be curved and it pulls right into here. If you draw a thinner tube, it's going to tend to look more feminine. If you draw a thicker tube, it will tend to look more masculine. Let's 
stop there. And uh, we'll look at it from the other end. So let's uh, do 10 two minute poses. separate those three things. Get the shape of the head, get the shape of the neck of some kind of tube, get the shape of the shrugging muscle, some type of say triangle. That takes us to the shoulder line. Now we finish the head connection to the outside. It really is connecting it to the arms. Now we're going to have to deal with the inside structure, but before we get to that, let's look at the other views. One more way to find your pit of the neck. So, ear lobe to pit of the neck, throat goes to the pit of the neck, collarbone goes to the pit of the neck, breastbone goes to the neck. Got all these things going to that same point. The more things we can get connected, we can get a couple ways to connect the neck down to that pit of the neck. That's better than one. So, the more the better. If we're behind it, what we're going to find here, let's uh, shape this a little bit, this is On the back view, what you'll find sometimes is the throat peeking out. Go to that sternocleidic mastoid, that little neck muscle, and you'll find that creates a tube. This thrusts out. Here's my tube. Now, I never bother doing the, the uh, third dimension of the neck because you've got a well-structured head, a well-structured torso. The neck has to bend the way it's supposed to bend without having to worry about it. So I don't worry about this, but just so you can see the tube, here's the tube. See, so don't you cool. sometimes talk about the gesture of the head? What's that? Don't you sometimes talk about the gesture? Of the yeah. Head? Is that? That's the gesture of the head. Okay. So it's not, not center line down the face, the closest thing you can see. It's a long axis of each structure. There's a long axis. Actually, the head has two long axes. Skull goes back, face goes down. So that's why we start with that bulging triangle to suggest both structures, both gestures, and give you a nice simple structure. But this is the one that most directly connects. Thing. So that's usually the one we, we fixate on. But that would be the gesture of the head, gesture of the neck, gesture of the torso, all these two ways. So this is the tube, and that's what we did the last time here. There's the gesture, and here was the tube here. And it came from behind the ear, around the ear lobe. Jawline in here, 
and then separate from the tube of the neck is our shrugging muscle. And you'll find from the back, although you won't always see it in the soft flesh, but you'll find that that shrugging muscle, that <coughs> triangle, is independent of our, our neck. In fact, it's behind it. Here's the neck. Here's the shrugging muscle. See how it's a step on top? Shrugging muscle down to neck, neck down to throat, and the face. We have a series of overlaps. We want to establish that simply, but we want to establish it. Here's my head. There's my throat, a little bit we can see. If I come from behind the ear, there's my external hyoid mastoid thing. There's the back of the neck. Nice curve too. Sometimes the neck will curve, sometimes it'll be straight. The throat will always curve unless you're drawing a guy like this. That's my head and neck. Here's the spine. Neck in the rib cage. Here's the shoulder line. I'm checking this distance. Here's the shrugging muscle on top of the neck. Overlapping. A series of overlaps. Like that. The order you do it's up to you. Maybe I'll draw the head and then I'll draw the spine and then I'll draw the shoulder line and then I'll do the shrugging muscle and then I'll do the little neck or the tube of the neck on top of that. Now, some, oftentimes the hairstyle will cover that connection. You still want to feel it. Draw through it, feel it. Always draw through. The most you'll ever see is half of the form. The illusion of your drawing having solidity is the feeling that the audience will have that even though they've seen the front, they really also feel the back. Even though they see the top, they feel the bottom. And that's what those construction lines do. When we do construction lines, we're giving them the momentum to feel around. That's just how it goes around. There's something over here we can't see. So I get to see the top and shoulder, but they need to feel the bottom and the elbow, even though they can't see it. The illusion of those construction lines, and then eventually the specific detail has to suggest that. It has to suggest the movement around the perspective to give us a feeling of the side we can't see, and it has to give a sense of the connection, how each isolated complete structure fits into the next structure. How does the gesture and the structure show through the detail? So whenever I add detail, no matter what it is, it can be a shadow shape, it can be a a soft tone, it can be line, it can be muscle, doesn't matter what it is, it has to either show gesture or structure or both. So if I just say, there's the separation of the tricep and the bicep, that's a useless line. Because it hasn't helped describe the shape of either one, hasn't helped describe the position of either one, am I on top of or underneath, in this case, should be on top of these, I'm on top of the arm, should be on top of the bicep and tricep. And it hasn't helped in gesture, how we flow from one of the structures to the other. So it has to in some way reinforce, and if it doesn't, get rid of it. One of the ways you'll know if it's not reinforcing is think of that line as an arrow. Where is it running to? Is it just dead ending against something? Or is it flowing, showing how it flows into something? 
How does the deltoid move into the shoulder blade structure? How does the bottom of the shoulder blade meet the back of the shoulder blade? How does that connect to the top of the shoulder blade? How does that top then flow into the shrubby muscle connecting with the deltoid? Look at how much information this is giving us there. Giving us a beveled top, a plain shade that we could then shade and color. Gives me the corner for the back meets the side. I can apply a new value system to that. Turns the corner and tells us how it fits to the other side. Tells us how it fits to the other side. Tells us how it fits to the other side. So it's set to either one. It's dead in. But if we turned it this way, it would feel like it's starting to flow back into the other form. And if we bow it this way, it would start to feel the completion of this form. Now it's starting to move in a structural manner and a gestural manner. Gesture is it's moving into a connection to a new form. Structure is it's completing the first form. Form, going from one side to the other, side to side. So that's what we're asking. So complete the shape. Complete the shape. Notice that one constructed side or one rendered contour can work with several things. Here's the back of the arm, bulging. That completes the tricep bulge. It also completes the, the whole bulge of the arm, including bicep and tricep. That works with stabilizing. This works with this. It also works with this. This works with this. It also works with this. Feel that? It's like the old spiral graphs. Remember those things where you just keep these circles going through? That kind of thing. We want these things to keep flowing. As long as you can do it, you keep the ride going. The roller coaster. As long as you can do it, the sun is rise. So things rise. So that's what we're after with our details. But the connection is, as I said, the order you do it doesn't matter. What I want to do is do an order where I'm not floating detail. Or if I do, if I float a detail for just a moment, don't let it float for very long. Come back and complete it. I float the shoulder line behind the neck, then I connect it with the shrubby muscle. But you want the tube in the neck, you want the gesture of chin to pit of the neck, or the gesture of the spine, you want the sagging uh, shrubby muscle, which is the sagging triangle, and you want them all to fit together. Shape, uh, face, shape of the face, shape of the neck, shape of the shrubby muscle. Gesture of the face, gesture of the neck, gesture of the shrubby muscle, which is just going to be the same as the neck. We don't even have to worry about that. Will it flow off the spine or will it flow off there? That's what we have to have. Those things, the way you do it in order doesn't matter. Complete the, draw the gesture, complete the shape. Draw the gesture, complete the shape. Draw the gesture, complete the shape. Gesture structure, gesture structure, gesture structure. Whatever process you do, it should follow those ideas. Gesture structure. Gesture structure. How much structure? Maybe a lot of structure. Maybe very little structure. It's up to you. But get the gesture and the complete a shape. That's just structure. Or a bunch of shapes. And then that'll lead you. Gesture, build some structure, that'll tell you exactly where to begin the next gesture. Build the structure. That'll tell you where to begin the next gesture. Build the structure. On and on and on. If you follow that two-step process, you're not going to be far off. And you'll find your mistakes more quickly. The gesture is the fundamental design of the form. It's more important than drawing a tube or a ball or a box. You can see we did all three for the arm. We drew boxes. We drew tubes and we drew eggs. And some forms were both. We had a boxy beginning to the shoulder and an egg-like finish. 
where the tubular beginnings of the arm and the box is in. So the shape you draw or the shapes you draw are what they are, the gestures first. Got to get the gesture. And you have to have a process where you get enough information that you can find exactly where to begin the next gesture. That's all we're really doing in all this stuff. Is we add enough information that we know where the next flow, the next life on the next gesture is. Then we build some stuff on it, and that tells us where the next one is. Build some stuff, and we the next one. Is. And that's what makes our drawing seem accurate. And that's why you can work in different styles. Is fundamentally you have that fluid design underneath the bulky stuff. And the stuff we do every artist is different. So one of the things you want to cultivate in your work is what ha what has to be there fundamentally. What is the essence that makes it what it is? It makes a tree look like a tree, that makes a sense of light look like light. If you can find what fundamentally makes it work, you've got so much room to play. That's how you can have so many different styles that all feel alike. There's a fundamental correctness to a day dog one, even though it's just these abstract linear marks. There's a fundamental correctness to a limb branch even though it's highly stylized, it looks realistic. Because they knew what was fundamentally correct, they could go wide, uh, wide off the beat, playing with the individual nuances. So fundamentally, it's the gesture. And if we can then get enough information that we know where the next gesture begins, that's what makes it work. Fundamentally, it's the light and dark value range that make it seem like a sense of light or the warm cool color shade that make it seem like a sense of light. You understand that, how cool, how dark, it's up to you. So let's do our next set, pick uh, three pins. So your real you can again go right off the ear low and go down that sternocleidoid and mastoid muscle to the center of the neck, and these will converge at that point. Now, in this case, we don't have the shoulder girdle in the way. Shoulder girdle is building up to the shoulders and arms. Now, the shoulders and arms are inside the contour of the torso. So they're out of the way, which is good, but we have a little trickier time showing them because they're going in and out of the paper. So, how do we show them? arm coming out, going back, and also the, it becomes a more subtle move into the rib cage because we can't hide the rib cage underneath this structure. So it, it's better and worse at the same time. The uh, pit of the neck always begins the torso, so the breastbone is going to build out this way. And I'm going to go ahead and show you how to connect the uh, rib cage here, which gives you the have to build on top of it so carefully. This is going to go down in the stretching stomach, so on the empty stomach, soft, whichever, down here. Now the trick here is realizing when we draw the torso, we're going to draw the torso away from line. And that's going to, we'll see that as, as crucial when we draw the front and back view of the shoulder view of the leg going to be way slight. The reason for that is if you look at the skeleton, the pelvic bone and the rib cage are about the same width. A little wider on the female, a little wider on the male. So when we add the waist, the spare tire muscle, it just fills in. That's where we get our two. Then the shoulder girdle with its chest and the pistis muscle fills out to the arm. And the bulky hip muscles build out and into the leg. So the hip with their muscle structure will bulge out from that waist a little bit, and the shoulders with their muscle and bone structure will build out a little bit a lot. Again from that. So we'll start with that. We're starting from the inside and building out. So that's going to keep that logic alive. So we're going to feel that waist slide too. So from any direction, we want to build the torso into the width of the waist, and then we'll end up adding chest and breast or shoulders and arms out from that. So we're going to get a waistline too. So what I need to know 
know to get this profile connection is that we have a specific end of the neck and beginning of the rib cage here, right at the tip of the neck. So that's an easy connection for my gesture. And that's crucial, getting the gesture before the structure and getting it to begin in a specific place. The gesture is the curved design line and the connecting line. Now realize what we're really trying to do is fit a little tube into a big tube. And when we look at the rib cage on the skeleton again, we realize that the rib cage starts higher in back and lower in front. And that's why your collars hang the way they do. The collar starts up higher and goes down lower, same with the neck and the drop low. That's following the rib cage structure. The ribs set up higher than the shrugging muscles on top of them. Then we fall down to the lower rib cage connection here. So the rib cage is actually a little bit longer in back than it is in front. And so what we want to make sure we do is not do this. Two things will happen. We'll end up with a little tiny rib cage and we'll end up with a giraffe neck. We want to make sure we're starting up higher. Exactly how high doesn't matter to us. Anywhere in there is fine. We're sculptors, so we'll refine it later. We want to make sure that the neck tube is high compared to this, and the rib cage tube begins high. And then we want to make sure we go down to a wider tube. Yeah. So what we're really drawing is the Coke bottle idea. Anywhere in here is fine. As long as this width, we get back to this width as quickly as we can. And keep that with pressure. And if it weren't a perfect profile, it wouldn't matter. It would be the same thing. And if it's recorded here, you could do that same thing. Like so we've really drawn this dense coat bottle that has whatever perspective it has. And this is it. So that's our connection. Now the shoulder girdle goes back in. If I'm straight on a, a profile, you'll probably see more collarbone than you will shoulder bone. And what you have to see is you. Here's the, the collarbone, starts at the pit of the neck, bumps right over the shoulder, and it's going to go right to the top of the deltoid. And we're just going to draw our deltoid egg and stick our tube of an arm out of it. Or we're going to go right across and just draw the tube bar out of it, whichever you prefer. Matter. You see that deltoid separate, draw it as an egg. If it doesn't separate, just put the tube right off the top. What we got is a really good beginning, a really good connection for our arm. Top of the shoulder, uh, top of the collarbone is the connection of the arm. And notice we go pit of the neck, step up collarbone. Or there might be or the S curve, but bump up to the collarbone, bump up to the collarbone, and then this fits in here. The armpit will be down here. You'll end up drawing a more disconnected rendered form. It will kind of feel like it ends down here when you actually render the arm. It will, arm will fade off into the torso through that low armpit. Area. Let's start up here. Don't, don't draw a pit of the neck and then do this. Don't do that. It'll feel disconnected. You always want things to touch. You always want things to touch. Touch it again. And this will bulge out, that'll bulge out. It will feel that as an A. Those are bulging over the A. Now, if we're a little bit more back view than front view,
This is just sagging for the little neck, bulging out to the big rib cage, coming back down to my waistline too. That's why the waistline. So you end up with an S curve. Skinny neck, big rib cage. Skinny neck, big rib cage. How you do it doesn't matter too much. It will get some fine in the rib cage. Now, for a little bit more of the back view, we can we'll see more shoulder blade. And what you'll probably see if you see a little bit more shoulder blade, you'll see the shoulder blade bumping on the surface, and you'll get a bit of a corner here. And you can chisel out this profile idea if you want to. And then just run right up across the uh, shoulder blade and do the same thing. There's my arm or there's my arm. Collarbone going around the front view more, which would be the uh, chest behind. Here's my shoulder blade and we'll, we'll understand your structure next week better. But there's the arm, and I'm using the shoulder blade at the top of the arm because I saw more shoulder blade. Or I'm using the collarbone at the top of the arm because I saw more collarbone. Whichever you see. And what we're really getting in effect, if we got way underneath this, you see the arm up here, and you feel the shoulder blade back here. Collarbone here. Notice what's happening. Side, back corner, front corner. See how it's boxing out? We're getting these chiseling structures that way. So, one of the, uh, the results of connecting things well is you start to separate planes. Here's the arm beginning, that's the top to the side. Here's the arm beginning, that's the back corner to the side, the front corner to the side. So eventually this is going to end up giving us these chiseled planes as we work. Now the last thing we have is the shrugging muscle, and you can, as the simple thing is, just leave it as we draw it. But what you may also see So we lay this in the same way as we did before. Falling on her shoulder blade on the back. And then what you may well see is here's our external slider and mastoid coming down. And then we have the shrugging muscle. Remember the shrugging muscle is a sagging triangle and it's going out to skinny neck, in fact behind skinny neck, to wide shoulder. So in this case, it's coming right out towards us. Now whenever you have something coming towards us, you have a couple choices. You can create a foreshortened perspective, the vanishing point going to the horizon line like railroad tracks or a tunnel going away from us, that kind of thing. That creates western perspective, the foreshortening, vanishing to nothing, coming out to its full width. And it will end at our eye level. Wherever our eye level is, that's where the horizon of the world is. This has been a, a, a source, great source of uh, dialogue for our philosophers. But there's another way to do perspective. And this is the Eastern. Actually, all, all cultures use this, but the Eastern we see, we see only here. And that would be two ideas. One is, if I've got a painting here, Japanese, Chinese, French, there's going to be two tools I use for perspective. One is, the higher I get in the composition, Say I'm going up a mountain, the farther I am from the viewer. That's the logic. If I put the object up higher, it's farther away from me would be the kind of idea. So if I put a little man up here on top of the mountain, 
and a little man down here at the bottom of the mountain are drawn the same size because in Eastern philosophy they're they're literal. They are the same size. So this guy's are both about six feet tall, and even though he's six miles away, he's still six feet tall. So why on earth would I draw him six inches tall? Why on earth six feet? That doesn't make sense. We'll make them both six feet. We'll draw them exactly the same size. But I'll put him above as he climbs the mountain and goes up into the landscape. Notice when we do a landscape, with very few exceptions, though, the eye line's going to be at least halfway up the picture. Not too often is it going to be down here in the eastern picture. It might in a turtle landscape or something over in the eastern picture. It's going to be up halfway or above. So if I have a guy standing on the, the grass here, and a guy standing on the grass here, he's closer to the, the horizon, he's farther away. So as we go up, he gets farther away. Not too often would it be the reverse. So we have that logic, and then we have the mountain trail, which is an S-curve. And if we use an S-curve or a zigzag, that will yank you back into space. So one of the things I could do is foreshorten my rib cage, but I can also zigzag or wobble up over the muscle form and take you back into space. And if I had a, uh, a shadow on the shoulder, and a shadow on the tricep, and a shadow over the bumpy elbow fold. Those zigzags will take us back in space. And we can do the same thing here. We can zigzag from the um, shrugging muscle, goes behind the neck to the base of the hairline, basically swings out to the shoulder. Now this is coming out towards us and the shoulder's going down. So we could do that. If you had a shadow this way, you'll actually see it's shading because this is concave, it digs out. So just by doing that idea, it will take us back, zigzag, same idea, one just around the transition and one just abrupt transition to the regress. But that will help take us back, and that will suggest it. So you can do that with a line or a tone. So let's stop there during the set, and um, next couple of sessions we will we'll work on the finishing of the shoulder dribble next week and the beginning of the torso. So let's do five, six, five. Six. About the uh, value system, how shape and value for the fundamental design, the tonal composition is called. And that's the fundamental design. It could be the backbone of whatever you do in terms of style. Now there's one other, fun, there's a third fundamental tool. The shape, in this case, is just something to hold the value system. And the value system is to develop a difference between light and shadow, between foreground and background, between local colors, black hair, white face, that kind of thing. So your value separates local values or local object separation, light and shadow separation, and foreground background separation. Now it can also be used, it should be used to make something that ambiguous. The dark hair and light might be the same value as the dark shadow on the background. So this background is shadow. Light that light lit hair, shaded background has to be the same dark value. Or the uh, you know, the light side of the black shirt might be the same value as the shadow side of the light face. So you'll get some ambiguity. Foreground background ambiguity, light and shadow back uh, ambiguity, and multiple objects. 
can become ambiguous. And that's the script. We end up grooving things that way. We get black hair and black hat in light. And that's the same value as flesh and shadow, wall and shadow, and shirt in light.
a value system that's designed to create form, to create a sense of life, to create a sense of depth, and to create a sense of main interest. The main interest kind of comes and goes. Is it all the figure? Well, we don't see the figures separating very well from each other, or even from the background in a lot of areas. It starts to get broken. The mountains that are way away start to become about the same value as the head, or the head that's very close, and the trunk that's middle about. And so there becomes this greater and greater ambiguosity, ambiguity, <laughs> ambiguosity, I like that and it becomes like wallpaper. Take a wallpaper. It's right flat on the surface. So what they became so interested in was the surface of the canvas. So as soon as that became the primary focus, then we were led to abstract expression. No objects at all. Just pure paint on the surface. This is what led to it. Actually, this is what led to it. Titian was known as the greatest portrait painter of his time. And in his later career, got sloppier and sloppier. And Vasari called it the uh, uh, painting with blotches. If you dab on the thing, you get close up in here. Well, they thought maybe he was at the time. They were thinking, well, he's this old guy, he's in his mid 80s, and he just gets sloppy and losing his stuff. And then they started to check into the writings of the time. The star has never been very um, reliable. And uh, have been since decided he meant to do it. And whether he did or not, the paintings have it. And it's what influenced Rembrandt, Paul Rembrandt's career, the same way as, uh, now if we do a close up, you'll see just dab blotches of paint. Before the highlights would be stumbled and blended in and glazed back over for these smooth, buttery transitions. <clears throat> and there'd be a little bit of texture to the paint, you know, a little bit of indulgence to the paint. But for the most part, only as much paint is needed to cover the area and glazes would smooth the paint strokes together, would soften the transitions between. He's the first guy with George Oni actually to record him. Started to soften the silhouette. Now we're starting to get soft edges. We always have soft edges as the form turns, but we never before had soft edges between silhouettes. He started to do it for the first time. And then he started to then later start dabbing paint with splotches dab on these paints and not blend them. And that led us to uh, Rembrandt. Rembrandt followed the same process. And Vasari said, if you're going to follow Titian's example, spend your whole career painting beautifully and technically uh, perfecting your technique, and then as you get on in years with a lifetime of experience, then you can indulge in this uh, painting with splotches. Because you have to know exactly what you're doing. And if you get too close, you see the splotches. That's just dabbed on. It's almost like a Franz Paul or a Sarkin. But, and what uh, Rembrandt would do is that in the studios would say, oh, don't get too close to him. He's kind of smelly paint. Stay back there. He didn't want him to tell him it was finished. And you'd see it from 30 feet away and it was finished. Because those blotches would be, were the right value and they would set back in. But you get up close and you'll see dabs of blobby highlights on the of things. So if you step back or you reduce it down, it looks very realistic. When you got up close, it looked unfinished. When you were not so close, it looked unfinished. But that was painting with that. It became more about the surface. And once that started to happen, then we could actually make everything lose its illusion and stay on the surface. That's what pattern is. Pattern, all painting has 
some sense of pattern, things grouping together and losing. And the fact is, it is, it is a flat sheet of canvas here. But we were always fighting that before to pull out of the canvas and feel like pure spiro that molding of light and shadow. Light and shadow. So uh, now, why deal with that? Why fight it? It is a flat piece of canvas. It is a flat graphic cut out of design. The illusion is just that it's not real. Let's play that up. And so the post impressionist started to destroy and muck around with perspective. Cezanne on tables would flip up like this. The side of the picture would be distorted from this side of the picture. So the drawing would be out of whack. And the value system would start to break apart. We wouldn't let everything go back into aerial perspective like a Turner would or a Monet would. We started to make the dark background with no real logic start to pick up with the areas in dark foreground. You wouldn't get a lot of massing together. You wouldn't get a lot of the dark objects here and the dark objects here melding the way we were using our system before. Before we wanted to meld dark silhouettes with other dark silhouettes and lose some of the silhouettes. But it had a very uh, solid basis. We were trying to create a greater whole. By doing this, we created more unity in our system. Now all of this unified into one value rather than having three objects break into three. Well here we got bits of a little bit of hair here, a little bit of shadow under on here, a little bit of dark uh, riverbank here, a little bit of dark mountain here, bush or shoe over here, and it's all just broken and it's flattened right out. And the same with the blue colors and the red colors and the drawing would be flatter and all that kind of stuff. We wouldn't get railroad, this, uh, railroad perspective drawings. We'd start to flip up the table part and make the uh, picture kind of out of whack and the shadow on it not quite fit. And we start to play with that sort of So pattern becomes a way of organizing things into greater whole. What it's like is like reading a newspaper. If you read a newspaper, I can have a newspaper. And you look at an image, it's actually not an image at all, with black and white. It's a series of little tiny dots. And if the dots get closer together, it looks darker. The dots get a little farther apart, it looks lighter. And the more you separate those dots, the grayer it gets. The closer you put them together, the more solid and mass it gets. And if we do this here, we start breaking things apart, the eye will just mass us into one big mess. Yeah, it's too much to look at, that's just one thing. And so what I can do by pattern, I can take, let's say, this light flesh here, and I'm going to do a striped shirt and a striped background and a table with a bunch of plums on it and the edge of a lamp with a dark shade on it and a cord doing this and a telephone over here with a light dial and a cord here and you start it all starts filling together now if we can make this more and more group and this bigger and bigger, we'll start to go to the simple area and we'll start to see that on its own. So the more we can group this stuff in the closer and closer pattern, 
each object becomes more and more difficult to observe, then we get that separation. And these guys will do it too. Lots of little broken shapes, bit of curtain, bit of mountain, bit of bird, little bit of the tree here. It becomes all kind of little stuff. We don't see it as quickly as the big simple things. So you get these two figures and white figures on white pillow. We see that first, more unified. But all the little middle value things, all the little highlights on the fabric, you don't see it as quickly. Distracted, it's static. So they would do it too, or they'd have a um, 